Hi, my name is Drake, and you guys might know me here as a comic tuber, but for some reason people still get blown away when they find out that I used to have two shows on a channel called Game Theory, Crossover and Smash History. I also did a little bit of script writing, most notably the mega viral Mario timeline episode. Now, I already made a dedicated video talking about why I left the company due to stuff going on in my personal life. It was completely voluntary and I have nothing but great things to say about all of my former coworkers. But the reason I bring this up is because back when I still worked there, I wrote a game theory script about the Sonic the Hedgehog timeline and it never got purchased. My tradition here on Comic Drake for April Fool's Day is to put the same level of research that I normally do, but on really dumb topics that don't fit the usual channel MO. So I figured what better way to celebrate than to dust off this old bad boy. Now, the reason why the video got rejected was because of two key points. On the one hand, Sonic lore is simultaneously dense, but vague at the same time. So in order for the video to make sense, it would require a lot of explanation on nitty gritty stuff that the average viewer wouldn't know or really care about. And that wouldn't work in the format of a typical episode of Game Theory. The second reason is that my theory on how the timeline works deals with time travel. And Matt didn't want to cover that subject in a Sonic video when there were other franchises where that is a much more prominent theme. I, on the other hand, have no such restrictions on my content, so I've taken my research, rewrote it in my own style, and made a couple of modern day tweaks using the official Sonic Encyclopedia. Yes, that is what that book is actually called. I love it. So at long last, here is my failed, rejected pitch for game theory that never was. Just remember, I wrote this in 2016, so I'm not going to be covering games that were released later on. Enjoy. Ever since I first played Sonic 2 on the Sega Genesis at my mom's ex-boyfriend's house, I have been captivated by the Sonic franchise. I watched the cartoons, listened to the soundtracks, and was always running around the playground with my arms behind my back because I thought it would help me go faster. But one thing that has always fascinated me about the franchise is the lore behind it all. I mean, when it comes to video game franchises with complicated histories, the Sonic series is right there at the top of the list. Most of the game's plots pretty much boil down to Dr. Eggman being a jerk and Sonic has to save the day. On the other hand, the titles that do have more involved plots tend to not have that many connections to the past and tell self-contained stories. So weaving all these games into a somewhat coherent timeline would require a nerd with way too much time on his hands to look through everything. Interviews with developers, old game manuals, obscure entries in the franchise the average fan wouldn't know all that much about, and plenty more. Hi, I'm that nerd, and I am definitely up to the task. So my dear viewer, grab yourself a chili dog and wash it down with a nice cold peach ring G Fuel energy drink because it's time to roll around at the speed of sound and try our best to uncover the definitive Sonic the Hedgehog timeline. Let's get started. First off, I need to make it clear that this timeline is only going to focus on the canonical video game titles. Yeah, 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 I know that the official Sonic Twitter account has stated that everything is canon, but that's just not true. We know for a fact that the comics, the various TV shows, and movies all take place in their own self-contained universes. The same thing goes for the Sonic Boom series, which is clearly established as being its own thing. And crossovers? Those are also alternate universes. And Sonic Twitter. Is everything really canon? Are you sure? Are you trying to tell me that the Bioware RPG Sonic the Dark Brotherhood for the Nintendo DS fits into things? Because the last time I checked, Kevin Ava, the former Sonic Online community manager at Sega Europe, has confirmed that's not the case, along with the official Encyclopedia. Now, the reason behind the Bioware series getting cancelled and being taken out of continuity is actually a deeply fascinating subject involving a lawsuit from the writer of the majority of the Sonic comics, Ken Penders. But that rabbit hole is its own complicated mess that I'm actually going to be diving into in a future dedicated video. So, if you want to know more, then make sure to hit that subscribe button and be on the lookout for it. But now that the housekeeping has been taken care of, we can finally start building up the framework of this timeline. The backbone was laid out in the amazing Sonic Generations, a celebration of the franchise's 20th anniversary that has Sonic teaming up with his younger, classic self on a journey throughout time, playing through the series' greatest hits. For the purposes of today's video, we are going to be paying attention to the order in which the levels take place, which are organized from the earliest title to the latest. And canonically, it makes a lot of sense that these games would happen in this order. So that gives us the original Sonic the Hedgehog, followed by Sonic 2, Sonic and Knuckles, Sonic Adventure, Sonic Adventure 2, Sonic Heroes, Sonic 06, Sonic Unleashed, and Sonic Colors in that order, which knocks out a good handful of titles. But of course, that's just the home console release. The 3DS port of Generations is notable because levels from Sonic Heroes, Sonic 06, and Unleashed are all absent, but in their place is an exclusive stage from the DS game Sonic Rush. 
Generation 3DS places this level between Adventure 2 and Colors, which is pretty vague, so we'll have to figure out where that goes later on. But for right now, this does a fantastic job of getting us started. All we need to do is fill in the blanks, and for that, we need to go deeper. You see, I'm not all that convinced that the first Sonic game is actually the first entry in the timeline, because of these snippets that I found in its Japanese manual, which were translated by SonicRetro.org user Wendy. By the way, this is far from the last time that we're going to be referring to the Japanese manuals as a source, and Wendy did a fantastic job of translating all of them. Anyway, the manual says that Dr. Eggman is up to his old tricks again, and that's followed up with Eggman saying, quote, Sonic, that annoying impertinent hedgehog. Thanks to him, my great plans are always laid to waste. Oh, but this time, I'm going to rub him out. With the power of science. This confirms that these bitter enemies have clashed before, and I believe that's what's depicted in the Japanese exclusive arcade game Sega Sonic the Hedgehog, where Sonic teams up with the heroes Mighty the Armadillo and Ray the Flying Squirrel, two characters that would go missing for a long time. As in, there is a literal missing persons poster for them in Generations. Considering that Sega Sonic was released the same month as the first game for Genesis, and with Mighty and Ray having not been seen since the arcade game's release, I think that makes a lot of sense for this title being way at the front of the timeline. Sticking with the classic era, let's take a look at another easy entry. It's common knowledge that Sonic & Knuckles is the direct sequel to Sonic 3, because they were originally meant to be the same game, but were split during development into two separate titles due to time constraints. To get around this, the Sonic & Knuckles cartridge has this one-of-a-kind adapter built into it, allowing for players to plug in Sonic 3 and play the games together as one big experience. It's an extremely cool workaround and is basically old-school DLC. So on the board it goes, right along with Sonic 3D Blast because it features Knuckles, meaning that it has to take place afterwards. Despite being released 16 years later, the controversial revival of the classic series Sonic 4 takes place right after Sonic 3 and Knuckles. But it's worth noting that much like its predecessor, Sonic 4 was divided into three parts that act as their own standalone titles. Episode 1, Episode 2, and the bonus side story, Episode Metal. The official description for Episode 1 says that it takes place right where Sonic and Knuckles left off, and by referring to the game's now defunct official website, we can see that Episode 2 takes place just a few months later. Perfect. Add it to the list. But what about Episode Metal? Well, that's pretty neat in its own right, because instead of being tied into Sonic 3 and Knuckles like Episodes 1 and 2, Episode Metal is all about the character of Metal Sonic following his debut in Sonic CD, opening with his defeat in that title at Stardust Speedway. Metal Sonic is heavily damaged during this fight, with the game cutting to a spooky black screen stating that a long time has passed, followed by the mechanical hedgehog being reactivated and starting the game proper. At the end of this really short story, Sonic and Tails are seen flying off to the beginning of Episode 2, which is where they'll soon encounter Metal Sonic as a boss. So this firmly places Episode Metal in between Episodes 1 and 2. Well, that's all fine and dandy, but it still begs the question that if Sonic CD happened before Episode Metal, then where does that game fall in the timeline? For that, we're going to need to bounce back to Generations, where Metal Sonic's boss fight on Stardust Speedway was recreated. But since CD doesn't have a dedicated level in the game, Metal Sonic just kind of hangs out in the area between Sonic 2 and Sonic & Knuckles. So by that logic, CD must take place in between those two titles. Okay, let's get back to some of the more obscure stuff. Like, did you know that there were 8-bit versions of Sonic's 1 and 2 on the Game Gear and Sega Master System? The first one isn't all that special from a lore perspective, as the Encyclopedia confirmed that it's simply just a retelling of the first game on the Genesis. But the second 8-bit title, verified by the same source and its Japanese manual, says that it's actually a different plot entirely from the corresponding Genesis game. So, where does that go? Well, the Genesis version of Sonic 2 saw the debut of Sonic's best friend, Tails, and the Japanese manual gives us a cute little prologue about when they first met, stating that Miles Tails Prower was a young fox that was teased for having two tails. But when he saw Sonic run by, Tails began to stalk him, hoping that he could learn to be just as cool as the blue blur. A couple of days later, Tails stumbled upon Sonic taking a nap underneath his airplane because apparently Sonic owns one of those, for some reason. But then Dr. Eggman shows up and starts wrecking havoc on the island, kicking off the events of the game. So what does all of this have to do with the 8-bit Sonic 2? It's actually quite simple. Despite being released a little bit before its Genesis counterpart, the manual refers to Tails as an established character. Therefore, the 8-bit title can't logically take place before Tails and Sonic met, so I'm pretty confident in putting this game right here on the timeline. Oh, we also can't forget about the Game Gear title Tails Adventure, whose Japanese manual adamantly states that it takes place before Tails met Sonic, so we can neatly place it before the Genesis 2. Admittedly, the American manual of Tails Adventure contradicts this, claiming that he and Sonic had just temporarily parted ways for some vacation time. 
but since the Japanese title is the original, I'm going to disregard this. Though, while we're on the subject of Tails, the manual for his other solo adventure, Tails Sky Patrol, states that he got separated from Sonic, which perfectly lines up with how the duo had been apart before the events of Adventure 1. The next key character that we need to focus on is Amy Rose, who, like Metal Sonic, made her first debut in Sonic CD. It's important to note that this time, Amy was a much younger character and sported a different outfit, before growing up and donning the look that we're now familiar with that debuted in Sonic Adventure 1. Because of this, that means that CD has to take place before Adventure 1, and that Sonic Drift 1 and 2 for the Game Gear, Sonic the Fighters, and Sonic R all happened in between, as every single one of those has the younger Amy. Though, speaking of Drift, that series featured a character called Fang the Sniper, who was quite popular on the Game Gear, before vanishing from the franchise entirely. Because of this, I think it's safe to say that those in the other Game Gear titles, like Sonic Blast and Sonic Labyrinth, all take place roughly around the same time. Thankfully though, these next few titles are much easier to fit into place definitively. See, we know that Sonic Heroes is a direct sequel to Adventure 2, as after that game, Shadow got Amnesia, which is a plot that carries on. And also in Heroes, he and Rouge the Bat teamed up with a robot designated as E123 Omega, who got a shout-out in the highly underrated title for the Game Boy Advance, Sonic Battle, which places it after Heroes. This game was centered around a robot named Emerald, who Dr. Eggman made a copy of in Sonic Advance 3, which easily slots it into the timeline around here. We can also slip Advances 1 and 2 in between Adventure 2 and Heroes because of the character Cream the Rabbit, who is seen meeting Sonic for the first time in this cutscene. Since he already knows her in Heroes, then that would cement Advance 2 as happening before it, and because Advance 1 takes place before its sequel, then it makes sense for it to go right there. Now, it's worth noting that some theorists like to place the Advance games before Adventure 1, since Cream was added as a background character in its updated re-release, Sonic Adventure DX. But because she never has an interaction with Sonic in the game, there's no way of knowing if they had ever met, which is why I'm going to leave Advance 2 where it is. So, let's circle back to some of the villains. Shadow's amnesia plot from Heroes in Battle is extended further into his own game, Shadow the Hedgehog. You know, the dark and edgy one where he has a gun. Damn it. This game canonically takes place three months after the events of Heroes, which is backed up by Omega making an appearance. So, on the board it goes, right here. And if we go back to Metal Sonic, things get rather interesting. See, although he's a recurring antagonist of the series, there were other robotic Sonic copycats, or copy hedgehogs, that came out before him, and they are clearly different models that led up to the finished product of Metal Sonic. First off, there was the Mecha Sonic of the Genesis version of Sonic 2. It's clunky, less refined, and didn't even get a finished paint job. And in the 8-bit Sonic 2, there's a slimmer, sleeker, and shinier model that enters the fray, complete with an oh-so-90s sci-fi visor. This helps back up the placement of CD after the two... Twos. But then there's the issue of Mecha Sonic that showed up in Sonic and Knuckles. If I'm placing CD before that, then how could I justify Eggman using yet another imposter hedgehog prototype? Well, for that, I think the canon is pretty clear. Metal Sonic was defeated in CD and wasn't reactivated until Episode Metal, which is canonically established as taking place before Sonic 3 and Knuckles. So it would make a lot of sense that after losing his creation, Eggman would go back to the drawing board and continue the Mecha Sonic line since the Metal Sonic failed. Sonic Lost World had the alien Wisps, who were introduced and used as the main gimmick in Sonic Colors, so that game would only make sense taking place after that. But take a look at this cutscene from Generations. Totally strange. Well, no stranger than rescuing genies in magic books or saving aliens in an interstellar amusement park. That line is a reference to the Sonic Storybook series, where Sonic gets pulled into other worlds based on classic stories, such as Arabian Nights and Sonic and the Secret Rings, and King Arthur in Sonic and the Black Knight. To me, with those being mentioned so casually, it gives the impression that those are recent events, so although it's a bit of a stretch, I'd be willing to bet that the Storybook series takes place right before Colors. But, alright, let's address the elephant in the room. Sonic 06. What can I say about this game that hasn't already been said a million times? It's universally heralded as the worst game in the franchise, and it's no surprise as to why. Crazy glitches, long loading times, human-on-hedgehog romances, and of course, Blaze the Cat and her time travel shenanigans. Blaze and her partner Silver come from a future that's been ravaged by an evil creature named Ilbis. Long story short, the game ends with some top-tier writing, where Blaze sealed away the beast inside of herself, and then she teleported away to another dimension. This completely negated everything that happened in Sonic 06, and changed both the past and the future. It's almost as if Sega knew that Sonic 06 would be a complete disaster, and made sure that it wouldn't affect the series' canon. But there's more to this than meets the eye. 
See, most fans know that Blaze was first introduced one year prior in the DS game Sonic Rush, where both Blaze and a new antagonist named Eggman Nega hail from an alternate dimension. However, Eggman Nega appears in the series Sonic Rivals, where he now claims to be from the future. Huh. Funny how both Blaze and Eggman Nega have shifting origin stories that revolve around both time travel and alternate dimensions. This leads me to believe the events of Sonic 06 completely altered the backstories of these two characters. But Blaze isn't the only one that altered the timeline. Ladies and gentlemen, I am here to tell you that the Sonic timeline was dramatically altered years ago, and I'm willing to bet that most of y'all didn't even realize it. So, 13 years before the events of Sonic 06, the franchise's timeline was split and led to the formation of two completely separate continuities. I know, bold claim. So let me back it up by going way back to the first game of the franchise that ever featured time travel, Sonic CD. In this game, Sonic is able to move through four distinct time periods, the past, present, good future, and bad future. So what if I told you that the main series of Sonic games that we've been playing ever since has actually been in the bad future all along? Don't believe me? Just take a look at Episode Metal and Sonic Generations. Which of these four layouts do these two games match? That's right, the bad future. In this split timeline, Sonic 4 couldn't have possibly happened in the good future since it directly contradicts the bad future that Metal Sonic hails from. And you know what's even more interesting? The 3DS version of Sonic Generations does have a Metal Sonic fight, but it does not take place in Sonic CD, with you instead having to race this fake hedgehog in the Casino Night Zone, a stage from the Genesis version of Sonic 2. Why would that, of all things, possibly need to be different? Well, what if the 3DS and console versions of Generations take place in different timelines? That would certainly explain why there aren't stages from Heroes, Sonic 06, or Unleashed on the 3DS, and why there isn't a stage from Rush on the console version. It's because the timelines are different. What's further damning is that the sequel to Rush, Rush Adventure, introduces a new character, Marine the Raccoon, who hasn't been seen, heard from, or even talked about in any game since, with one sole exception the DS version of Sonic Colors. And by the way, that only happens in the DS version. Not to mention that there's several other cameos from Sonic's supporting cast that are exclusive to this DS version. This leads me to believe that all of the handheld versions of the mainline titles take place in this alternate good future timeline. And honestly, the more I dug into this, the more it just made sense. The split timeline easily explains why continuity is so inconsistent across the board. For example, Team Chaotix and Heroes is made up of characters that debuted in a little-known title called Knuckles Chaotix, which canonically takes place after the events of Sonic 3 and Knuckles. However, in an interview with the head of Sonic Team, Takashi Azuka, he claimed that, quote, in my mind, I didn't bring back the Team Chaotix characters from the past. Instead, they're new characters who happen to fit into the game. I wanted to create one team that was totally different from how Team Sonic talks and acts. Those three characters, Charmy, Espio, and Vector, they're so unique in their actions, personalities, and goals. They add a lot of flavor and variety to the overall picture. There's also the fact that those characters have never been used by Sonic Team we weren't involved with Knuckles Chaotix. Some other internal Sega development team did that. So it's not a matter of bringing up old characters. We recreated those characters from the ground up. We want Sonic to be Sonic and for the others to be supporting characters. I'm very happy with the way Team Chaotix turned out, so I hope they'll be brought back in another title in the future. You'll see more of them. And you know what's crazy? While, yes, the 3DS release of Generations doesn't have stages from Heroes and Sonic 06, there are boss battles from both games. On top of that, the way that both versions of Generations open is slightly different. On the home console, all of Sonic's friends are enjoying a birthday party for him, but then they're taken by this monstrous thing called the Time Eater. On the 3DS, on the other hand, the Time Eater captures everyone but Tails before the party even started. And in the console version, every time you finish a stage, you rescue one of said friends. Meanwhile, on the 3DS, you don't save the rest of Sonic's supporting cast until the end of the game. Both titles have the same general premise, but are slightly different on execution. If you combine that with Marine exclusively being name-dropped in the handheld port of colors, it can easily be extrapolated that some of the storylines do end up happening in both timelines, but with slight variations. Like, say, a version of Heroes that featured the original version of Team Chaotix. So, there you have it. A cohesive split timeline with the bad future of the mainline titles and the good future of basically all of the handheld games backed up with intense canon. And I'm pretty sure that I managed to squeeze everything on there. What about Dr. Robotnik's Mean Bean Machine and Sonic Spinball? Those are in the cartoon universes. What about those Japanese ride games? No. Just... no. Look, if you made it this far, then thank you so much for watching. I think without scatterbrain this explanation I had to get, it's pretty understandable why this wouldn't have worked out for a Game Theory episode. But thank you for indulging me. 
I don't get to talk my passion for gaming all that often on here. So it means a lot that you let me do my thing. And hey, if you enjoyed this, then please consider watching more of my videos. Even if you don't think you like comic books, I'm sure this channel might surprise you and be at least a little entertaining. So anyway, happy April Fool's Day, everyone. I hope you learned at least a little something new, and hopefully I'll see you next time. Oh crap, I forgot Sonic Riders.